Hi, welcome to Shady Grove. My name is Chris. I'm one of the pastors here, and I'm so glad you're joining us online. Um, if you're new, you can go to shadygrove.net, and you can find our Connect page, and we just love to get some information with you. One of our pastors or someone on staff will contact you and just get to know you a little better. If this is your church, welcome back. We're so glad that you are here. We pray that God does something incredible in your heart during this service. So sit back and see what he has to say to you today. Good morning, good morning. It's so good to see you guys all this morning. It's so excited to see you. Um, I'm glad you made it. As you can tell by my my voice, don't ignore the the loud voice. If you're watching online, I did that on purpose just for you. Um, we're so glad you're with us, whether in the room or online. Um, we cannot wait to worship with you this morning. A couple of things. Um, Children's ministry is going strong. Pastor Irene's doing a great job connecting with our students online. Make sure there's videos. Uh, this week's video and this week's lesson is there in this post-it note series. And this week's lesson is about slow down. All right, she says, we, we're so busy, but we should never forget to put God first and spend time with him. And I think that's very um, applicable for all of us, right? There's so many times in our lives things happen, and it'd be great for us just to put a post-it note in our bathroom or somewhere that says, hey, slow down for a minute. Make sure we spend time with God before we go through our to-do list. And then our pre-K lesson is in Jeremiah 29, 12, which talks about, I, I can talk to God anytime, anywhere, and about anything. And just this reminder that God is always accessible to us, no matter what's going on. Um, with that, will you guys stand with us? I want to I want to read this scripture over you this morning. Out of Isaiah 6, Pastor Todd is with us again, and so um, this kind of leads into his message, and I think this is just a really good reminder as we prepare our hearts for worship, prepare our hearts for what God has for us later today. Let these words out of Isaiah 6 kind of be read over you. And it says this, starting in verse 6, Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar, with it, he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin is atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And I said, Here I am. Send me. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for today. In the midst of just being ready to receive what you have for us, let us have that attitude, God, of here I am, and send me. We may not know what's going on. We do not know the future. Sometimes we don't even know what you're calling us to do. But let us have that blind faith of knowing whatever it is, we know you would not call us to something that you would not be with us through. And so let us have the attitude to say, here I am, Lord. Send me. Be this this morning. I, I thank you in advance for what you are going to do in the lives of everyone in this room and watching online. We love you and we praise you. In your name, amen. All right, good morning, Shady Grove. It's good to see you. Looking good today. Glad to have you online with us today, and I uh, hope you came ready to worship the Lord this morning. We're going to open up the heavens and bring His Spirit in. You ready? All right. Yeah. Our lives, our hearts, our hands We're reaching out to see you move again 
We can hardly wait. Come flood this place. We're ready now. It's all about to change. Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done. Let your fire fall. Let your fire fall. Open the heavens. It's yours, unlock the gates and open up the doors. Let your kingdom come, let your will be done. Let your fire fall, let your fire fall. Open the heaven, pour your spirit out on earth. Unleash your presence. Mountains shake. What was dead now comes away. Every captive breaking free. Right now, right now, right now. Darkness trembles. Mountains shake. What was dead now comes away. Every captive. some praise this morning. Yes. He's the king of your heart. Let the king of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from. Oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide. The rest of all my life, oh, he is my song. You are Let the king of my heart 
When the night is holding on to me, God is holding on. When the night is holding on to me, God is holding on. Amen. Father, thank you. King of our hearts. Father, make it be real for us. You are the king of our heart. May we put our full trust in you, Father. You're so good. So good, Father. And we just want to claim that today. Thank you for the worship we got to experience, but most of all, you were pleased with, Father. Just give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. You guys can be seated. Thank you so much. Good morning, church. Good morning out there in the interweb and everything else. So uh, it is an honor and a privilege to be with you guys once again. As Pastor Chris said, our scripture's coming from Isaiah chapter 6 this morning. Um, It is the call of Isaiah. Uh, After laying out some things the first five chapters, he goes back to his call. And in verse 1 of chapter 6, Isaiah, he says, In the year that King Uzziah died... I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphs, each with six wings. With two they covered their face, and with two they were flying, and they were calling out to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the whole earth, is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. And at the sound of their voices, the doorpost and the threshold shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried, for I am ruined. I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphs flew to me with a live coal in his hands, which he had taken with the tongs from the altar, And with it he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips, your guilt is taken away, and your sin atoned for. And then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me. And he said, Go and tell this people, Be ever hearing but never understanding, Be ever seeing but never perceiving, Make the heart of this people callous, make their eyes dull and close their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts and turn and be healed. And I said, how long, Lord? And he answered, until the cities lie in ruin and without inhabitant, until the houses are left deserted and the fields ruined and ravaged, until the Lord has sent everyone far away and the land is utterly forsaken. And though a tenth remains in the land, it will again be laid to waste. But as the turbineth and the oak leave stumps when they are cut down, so the holy seed will be a stump in the land. It's God's word for God's people. We live in a day when we hear constantly the cry for justice and peace. But Steve Deneff once said, there will be no justice in the streets until there is holiness in the church. Isaiah, like most of the Old Testament prophets, will declare that the problem with the world is not the world, but the problem with the world is the people of God. And the problem with the people of God is their perception of who God is. We have downsized God. We have made God so friendly and and such a, a big buddy and we've emphasized reckless love so much to the point that we have forgotten that God's love and God's forgiveness and God's companionship is grounded in the truth that above all and before all, God is holy. He is holy above all of creation. We have made what Isaiah calls the Holy One of Israel the big man upstairs. 
N.T. Wright says that we need to be constantly looking harder at the God of the Bible. Otherwise, we will discover that gradually the picture we have of him gets domesticated, whittled down to something that we can live with. And gods that we can live with comfortably are called idols. People in Isaiah's day had forgotten who their God is. They had made the things of God common, ordinary. And God no longer required anything of them. And Isaiah will come and remind them that their God is not common. He's not ordinary. He is holy. That he is the creator of heaven and earth. That God holds the earth in the palm of his hand. That he is enthroned above all rulers. That he controls the heavens. That he is incomparable to anything else that we know. That he is above all and before for all that he is holy. Isaiah tells us that it's the year that King Uzziah died and scripture tells us that Uzziah was probably one of the strongest and most powerful kings to rule in Jerusalem since Solomon. He would become king when he was 16 years old and he would reign for 52 years. And, and during his reign, the Philistines and all the surrounding nations that, that, that had threatened Israel, all of a sudden God had given them victory over that. And, and it would be a prosperous times and Uzziah would fortify the city of Jerusalem and the harvest would be plentiful and, and the army would be organized and equipped. And scripture says his fame grew far and wide, but as he became powerful, he also became prideful. And he made the things of God common. And one day he goes into the temple forgetting his place, forgetting that God had set certain rules and regulations for entering the temple. And Uzziah went to burn incense, which only a priest could do. They tried to stop the king, but he had the censer and made his way towards the altar of God when God struck him with leprosy. Once he come down with leprosy, he would spend the rest of his days quarantined from his family, quarantined from the temple of God, unable to enter once again because he had made the things of a holy God common. And it's at the end when he dies that Isaiah makes his way to the temple. And Isaiah learns firsthand that God is holy. And the first thing he learns about God's holiness is that it is majestic. Isaiah sees the Lord and the Lord is veiled by the wings of the seraphs. And he says he was high and exalted. In Revelation chapter 4, John enters the throne room of heaven and he sees something very similar to what Isaiah sees. He sees God on the throne surrounded by jewels and colors capped by rainbow like emerald and from the throne will come lightning and, and rumbles and peals of thunder. There's no description in Revelation or Isaiah of the person on the throne because all we need to know that in our world and in our time and in this age, that God is there, that he is on the throne, that he is in control, and that he is holy. And Isaiah begins to try to describe the Holy One and what he saw, and he sees God in his holiness, surrounded by majesty, the King eternal. He is sovereign and in control. Our tendency is to shrink God down, and we forget his majesty and the wonder of who he is. When I first become a believer, I had not really, I, I didn't have any perfect attendance pins in Sunday school. I'll put it that way and everything. So when I first become a believer, I didn't know a lot of scripture and didn't know a lot of the stories and things you pick up in Sunday school. So, you know, at our house, I found the Bible. It was a King James version of the Bible and and. Just to be honest, I couldn't follow it. I was like, what is this? And I couldn't understand this. And, and, you know, all the these and the thous. And I, I was just lost. I, you know, my Kings Mountain High School education had not prepared me for, for this. And so, you know, um, I found in our house also, though, this huge red story Bible. And I still have that. Uh, and 
it, it's just like the, the stories of the Bible told like you would read to a child at, at night and there were questions in the back of it. And I found myself reading that because I could grasp it and answering the questions in the back to make sure I understood it. And what I remember even to this day when I look at that big red story Bible is how in awe of God that I was and how he just enthrilled me and how I was reading things about how powerful God was and how our God could do miracles and God could deliver us and God was working in people's lives and, and there was nothing that, that I thought God could not do. There was just a sense of awe and wonder at the power of who he is. Be honest and tell you that sometimes as a pastor now, I go to God's word and it's like, I've been there, done that. I know this story. And sometimes God's Spirit checks me because I have made the things of a holy God common. And I have lost sometimes a sense of awe and wonder of whose presence I am in. When we come into church, sometimes we come in and, and, and we've made coming into the presence of God common, ordinary. And we forget when we gather together whose presence that we are in, that we are the body of Christ, that we have entered into the presence of a holy God. And if there's one thing the church needs to do today, it's to once again recapture who our God is, to be in awe of his wonder, of his power. I mean, listen to what Scripture says about God just in a few places. In Psalm 29, it says, Ascribe to the Lord, you heavenly beings, ascribe to the Lord the glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due His name. Worship the Lord in splendor of holiness. In Psalm 8, it says, "How, O Lord, O Lord, how majestic is Your name in all the earth. Psalm 19 reminds us that the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of His hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they reveal knowledge. They have have no speech, they use no words, no sound is heard for them, yet their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. Psalm 145, it says, great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. Exodus 15, after the children of Israel cross the, the Red Sea and they get on the dry land, they begin to worship the Lord and they say, who among the gods is like the Lord? Who is like like you, majestic and holy. In the book of Job, after 35 chapters of, of Job wondering why this has happened to him and three friends who have showed up to ask questions and give a theological debate, finally God speaks out of the whirlwind and he basically says to Job, sit here and let me ask you some questions, Job. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you understand who marked off its dimension. Surely you know who stretched the measuring line across it. Where's the footings of it set? Who laid the cornerstone while the morning stars sing all together and the angels shout for joy? And for three chapters, it's question after question of God asking Job, where were you when I did these things? David's last recorded prayer in 1 Chronicles, he will simply say, yours, Lord, is the greatness, the power, the glory, the majesty, the splendor, everything in heaven and earth is yours. Yours, Lord, is the kingdom. You are exalted above all. And later in Isaiah, God will look at the prophet to give them a message to the people. And it's a question, who will you compare me to? Who is my equal? On and on, Scripture reminds us of the vastness and the power of our God. And I wonder as we gather together to worship Him, when we get together to exalt the name of the Lord, do we remember whose presence that we have entered into, that our God above all is a holy God? As the old king Uzziah died, the true king makes himself known, and he is on the throne. 
He reveals himself to Isaiah. And God shows himself to be the constant, holy king, sovereign, Lord of all. Isaiah sees the king in his beauty. He feels the doorpost shake. A couple weeks ago, we felt the earth shake. I imagine it wasn't quite what Isaiah was feeling. And the, and, and the smoke begins to fill the room around Isaiah. And he sees the king and his beauty and the angels are praising and, and he's reigning in holiness. And the song that Isaiah hears over and over, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. Church, we tend to see trouble and anxiety all around us. We, we tend to look at CNN, Fox News, whatever, and, and, and we think, yeah, man, the whole earth is full of trouble. It's full of chaos. What's happening? But Scripture says the whole earth, if we look through spiritual eyes, is full of the glory of God. It's all around us. The psalmist asks, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? God is all around us, reigning in holiness. And Isaiah's response is he hears the people crying out, and he begins to see himself. And he says, woe is me. What does it mean if God's holy? We tend to think that means that Holy means clean, it means pure, it means something to that effect, extremely good, but in reality it means separate, to be set apart. So if God is holy, if God is set apart, what is God set apart from? And the answer is me and you. He's set apart from us because of our sin. He is holy. The, the prophet Habakkuk says, your eyes are too pure to look on evil. You cannot tolerate wrongdoing. And Isaiah, like everybody else, once he has a glimpse of, uh, uh, of God's holiness and, and who it is, he is undone by it. Uh, um, you, you look in Scripture, Moses, when he confronts God's holiness, takes off his shoes and, and, and stands there bare before the Lord. Ezekiel will fall face down. John will fall as if dead. And, and, and Isaiah cries out, woe is me. I am undone. I'm ruined. You see, God's holiness reveals our heart. It exposes who we truly are. It exposes not the facade that we put on in front of each other, but when we come face to face with God's holiness, we see who we are on the inside. It reveals who we are. And Isaiah, the man of God, realizes his sinfulness, but not only does he realize his sinfulness, he realizes the sinfulness of the people. Isaiah says, I am a man of unclean lips. You ever wonder why he talks about lips? Of all things, why is lips? And I think it has something to do with the fact that our lips reveal what's in our heart. What is in your heart, Jesus says, will eventually come out of your mouth. And you may say you're kidding, and you may say, well, I'm just joking, but in reality, it's a snapshot of what's happening in your heart. And when you come face to face with God's holiness, your heart is revealed. And Isaiah, having his heart revealed, realized that he was unclean. And as he sees all of heaven worshiping the Lord God, he realized he could not take part in that song. He could not cry out, holy, 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 because he had sin in his life. He revealed the sinfulness of his life. And, and his response is to be sorrowful, to be full of terror, to cry out, woe is me, for I am undone. When we come face to face with God's holiness, our first response will not to be to burst in song or to dance or to pew jump or whatever it is. Our first response always when we come in contact with God's holiness is to fall on our face because it's a revelation of our sinfulness. And until we become undone by that, we're not going to be able to join the worship song. His purity reveals our vanity. 
His glory reveals our shame. And it's the reason why Adam and Eve, when they sin, they cover themselves, they hide, they cannot be in the presence of the Lord God Almighty. But not only does it reveal Isaiah's sin, it reveals the people's sin. And Isaiah says, you know, I am a man of unclean lips and I live among a people of unclean lips. You read the first five chapters of Isaiah and it's God laying out like a prosecuting attorney everything that he has against not the world but against the people of God. And, and, and God tells Isaiah, this is what I have issue with the people of God. They have become corrupt. And then he compares them to Sodom and Gomorrah and he says their worship is a ritual and it's a sham. It's become meaningless to them and to me. God says your services are a burden to me. He says I hide my eyes from you. I will not listen to you. You have become like a harlot and a rebel. You have become a companion of thieves. And that's basically just the introduction. And then he goes on and he lists on and on the things that he has, not against the world, but against the people of God. And Isaiah begins to realize the depth of their iniquity, that they have been cut off from the Holy One of Israel. We sometimes read this message and we cut it off after Isaiah's response. Here am I, send me. And we think, all right, I'm going to go to the world. And when we do that, we lose the message that God gave to Isaiah. And the message God gives to Isaiah is he reminds Isaiah that, you know what, Isaiah people are going to, they're going to perceive, but they're not going to see. They're going to hear, but they're not going to understand. They're going to have callous, dull eyes. And Isaiah says, how long? And God basically says, until everything's ruined, till I cut everything off and all that's left is a stump. You see, when God's holiness is revealed to us, we can either seek God in repentance or forgiveness, or we can harden ourselves and pretend like everything is fine and dandy and ignore that, that God is holy and ignore that we have failed God and not repent of the things that we have failed to be as the people of God. And God says, I will cut it all down. I will cut it down to there is nothing left but a stump. Sometimes we in the West don't think God would do that. I mean, look at, look at the children of Israel. I imagine they looked at Isaiah and said, we are the people of God. This is the city of Jerusalem, the city of David, the city that God has sworn to protect. We have the line of David. We have the temple. This is the place where heaven and earth meet, where God has descended upon this earth. God's not going to destroy that. And God tells Isaiah, tell them I'll cut it down to a stump. And sometimes in our culture, we think that, you know, God wouldn't bring judgment on us. God's going to rapture us out of here and everything's going to be fine and everything's going to be hunky-dory. And we fail to fall on our knees in repentance for not being the body of Christ that we have been called to be. Until the church repents, how can we expect the world to be healed? And I believe that one of the things that God is doing to the church in this time and this season is calling us to repent, calling us to once again be the people of God, to capture a glimpse of who we are and how we have failed to take the message of Christ. We've become consumed with our comfort and our kingdom and not his kingdom. And until the church repents, we can't expect God to come and heal this world. We need to weep for our churches and weep for ourselves to humble ourselves and pray and seek him and turn from our wicked ways. God's holiness reveals that sin in us. How we've become self-absorbed and we've made everything about us and our preference and not about him and his kingdom and his holiness but God's holiness is also merciful so I always find it interesting that David one time counted the people. He did a census among the people, which was something that God had forbid any kings to do. 
because God wanted them to trust in him, not their numbers. But David counts the people. And they try to tell David not to do this, but David does it anyway. And after David counts the people, God sends a prophet to David and says, David, here's what's going to happen. Judgment's coming, and you have a choice. You can have three years of famine on the land. You can have three months of being swept away by your enemies. Or you can have three days of the sword of the Lord bringing plague on you. And so David begins to contemplate what he wants to happen. And his response is kind of amazing because he says, you know what? I don't want famine in the land and I don't want to fall in the hands of my enemies. He says, I want to fall in the hands of the Lord because I know the Lord is merciful and great. David says, I know I've sinned and I know punishment and judgment is coming from that. But I also know that my God is merciful. You see, church, God's not just a fairy godmother who comes to wave a wand and make everything all right. And he's not some doting grandparent who turns the other way as we do our mischievous things. He is the Holy One of Israel. He is sovereign. And he loves us with a holy and a fierce love. And this love comes with great mercy and kindness and he acts to bring glory to his name and he bestows salvation and joy and peace on the earth unto his people because he is holy. Holiness is first and foremost love. Wesley defined it as perfect love. He didn't say it was another power and he didn't compare it to tongues and he didn't say it was another blessing and he didn't say it was a second work of grace. What he said is that holiness is perfect love. That's why the apostle John can look at God and say he is love because love is always tied to his holiness and who he is. God's mercy and God's love is not separate from his holiness. It flows out of it. I mean, consider Isaiah as he is there in this moment realizing his sinfulness that the people of God have become sinful. And he's seeing all of heaven worship God saying, holy, holy, holy. All of a sudden an angel, a seraph, leaves the worship to grab a tongue from the, from the altar and he gets a burning hot coal and he comes to Isaiah. And I can imagine Isaiah just kind of squelching down away from the angel as the angel brings brings the coal to his tongue and it touches his lips. It doesn't burn Isaiah. Amazingly, it cleanses him. And, And Isaiah receives a word of mercy and forgiveness. Your guilt is taken away. Your sin is atoned for. See, we tend to think that God's holiness will burn us. But in reality, it cleanses us. It makes us something that we would never be on our own. It changes us, transforms us. Isaiah reminds us that God's holiness overwhelms. It purges. It breaks us down, but it brings forth new life that reflects His glory. At the end of the chapter, Isaiah just simply says the the holy seed will be a stump. And the picture is this tree that has been cut down. It looks like it's there all is ruined, but there is life in the tree and shoots begin to grow out of the stump and there's new life that begins to appear. And Isaiah said, this is the holy seed. You learn from scripture that all of Israel will be cut down to a stump. He will say in Isaiah chapter 11, a shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his root, a branch will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him. The spirit of the Lord of wisdom, of understanding, of counsel and power. The spirit of knowledge and of fear of the Lord. And he will delight in the fear of the Lord. Isaiah tells us all of Israel will be cut down to a stump, but out of that stump will come a shoot from the root of Jesse. And he will be the way that God saves and redeems his people. 
And in life, when we are confronted with God's holiness and our sinfulness, it has a way of chopping us down and, 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 and taking away everything. But God's holy seed in us begins to develop a new life. And we have new power. And new things come out of us that we never dreamed or imagined because it's God's Holy Spirit at work in our life. It's not willpower. It's not a 12-step program. It's the reality that God and His holiness has entered into our life, removed our sinfulness, cleansed us from that, atoned us from that, and now He has brought new life. When I was a, a kid growing up, probably, I don't know, seven, eight, or, you know, used to go out to my grandpa's house all the time, and he kind of lived out in the country then. My mom and dad live in that house now, but when I remember going out there to grandpa's, in the front yard, there was this stump that grandpa was always at. In the evening, he sat on that stump. Sometimes grandpa would go fishing, and he would come back, and he would clean fish on that stump. And, and my mom and dad's neighbor had a St. Bernard dog. I mean, just huge dog. looked just like Beethoven. And um, I remember going out there, and, and, you know, I'd be eye to eye with him, but he'd be sitting out there with grandpa, a dog named Tiny. And, uh, you know, just those are the things I remember. But the thing that has happened over the years, you know, after Grandpa died, Mom Dad moved in the house and did some things. I remember, you know, we'd go out there to work on the house and stuff, and there would be shoots coming up out of that stump and never thought anything about it. But the last time I was at Mom and Dad's, I noticed that tree now is probably about 50, 60 foot tall. The limbs that cover the front yard. I said something to mom and dad about it, and mom started, we got to cut that thing down again, you know, the stuff falling on the house, this, that, and everything, because it's a huge tree now. And that's what God's holiness does to us. It cuts us down. And sometimes it's painful, but it removes the sin. It brings atonement and forgiveness. But in that, it also brings new life. In church, we're not going to have new life. And you're not going to have revival until you as a body come face to face with God and His holiness. And you're not going to have new life and revival in your heart until you come face to face with who God is. And once again, live in wonder and in awe that our God is holy until we once again join the song of heaven. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of His glory. Do you see it? Let's stand together, church. We're going to close in prayer. And I just ask you, are you living in wonder and in awe of who God is? Have you asked God in His holy mercy and love to forgive and atone any sin in your life? It may be sin that nobody else can see, but you know it. It may be pride. It may be something that nobody else in the world has a clue that's there, but you know as His Holy Spirit checks you that it's there. Are you living in new life and mercy that He brings? Let's pray together. Father, we thank You that You are a holy God. And Father, we pray that You once again help us as the body of Christ and the people of God to get a fresh glimpse of who you are, to ascribe to you the glory that is due your name, to bring in our worship and our offerings with gladness, that we will tremble before you, but that we will worship you in all of your splendor and holiness. We ask it in your name. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Dad. So that's a good reminder for us.
right, this week to never take God's holiness, to never take God's power for granted. He can do so many good things, but our job is to honor him, to respect him. And so thank you so much for worshiping with us. If you're online, thank you so much for watching. We're so glad to be with you today. I'm on your way out. If you're in the room, you can see that there's some offering baskets in the back. If you want to drop your offering in there, you can also give online, shadygrove.net. You can mail it in. There's a, a little box outside the office on your way out that you could also drop it in. But we're so glad you're here again. Let's do it again next week. Sound good? All right, so go in God's, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, go in his name. You are dismissed. Thank you for watching online. We'll see you next week.